Okay, one more talk before lunch. Um, this is with Morgan Chu, and his title of his talk is Unlocking Value with Intellectual Property. So Morgan has been described as beyond doubt the most gifted trial lawyer in America. I actually met Morgan over 20 years ago uh, through his older brother, Steve Chu, who was on the board of the first company I ever did out of business school called Helicos Biosciences. His brother, Steve, is a physics professor at Stanford. He was director of Lawrence Livermore National Lab. He was also energy secretary in the Obama administration. Their older brother, or their oldest brother, Gilbert, is an MD, PhD, and a professor of biochemistry at Stanford. And then there's Morgan. Um, Morgan dropped out of high school, left home, but somehow managed to earn five university degrees by the time he was 25, all without a high school degree. A BA, MA, and PhD from UCLA, a master's in law from Yale, and a JD M uh, magna cum laude from Harvard. So th th that's not really the biggest ad for high school education. But anyways, we'll um, welcome Morgan to the stage, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. I should say my eldest brother, Gilbert, we say, I say, he is the smartest. And my middle brother, Steve, we say, and I say, he is the most famous. And I'll leave open for questions. You can ask me what my brothers say about me. But I want to use two case studies to illustrate how to unlock the value of intellectual property. One involves computers, and the other involves biotechnology. These are actual cases. There was a group of students at Caltech. They were about to graduate. And they say, well, what are we going to do after we graduate? A couple of them worked for big companies like IBM and Hewlett Packard, and they say, we don't want to do that. We want to go into business for ourselves. Well, they didn't have any product or product ideas. They didn't have any money, but they were very smart. So what do you do? Of course, you go into consulting. So they had a grandiose title for their company. They said, we'll call ourselves state-of-the-art consulting. They got a few hundred square feet above some retail shops in a dusty little building, and then they hung up their shingle. Someone came in and said, hey, we want to measure the depth of glaciers, but not the old-fashioned way. And they came up with a better way. Someone else said, we want to measure the dimensions of the human eyeball without move, removing it from the socket. And they came up with a better way to do that. And someone else came in and said, we want a better way to do data compression. And they came up with a way to do that. And they had the foresight to say they would own the intellectual property rights after they finished their project. And lo and behold, it caught the attention of Bill Gates. At the time, the average hard drive had 20 to 80 megabytes. Now think about that. You put an operating system on it, you buy another application program from Microsoft, and you've run out of space. So Gates was very interested. He personally reached out to the people at Stack Electronics, state-of-the-art computing, and he negotiated over several months. They didn't come to an agreement. The parties went their separate ways. And that happens. But many months later, Microsoft began to distribute the beta version of its next operating system. And as many in this audience probably know, they would distribute tens of thousands of copies. Shortly after that, within a week, I get a call from the people at Stack. And they're angry, upset, and disappointed. They said, they're infringing our patents. I said, how do you know that? Because the operating system is only distributed in object code form. And they laughed and laughed and said, Morgan will show you. They taught me in about 30 seconds how to create pseudo source code for any part of the operating system. Because they found a back door that the Microsoft engineers had buried into the operating system so they could fine tune and improve the operating system.
And once you unlock the back door, you could look at any of the functions in the operating system and take the object code and create pseudo source code. 30 seconds later, since I knew the keystrokes, I could do that. And they said, what do we do? And they thought long and hard about it. Because it's very difficult if you're a young person to think, gosh, we may be firing at the king of software. We've got our whole lives ahead of us. And there was lots of discussion back and forth. Should they or should they not go forward with the suit? In the end, they decided that it didn't seem right to them. And they decided they had to stand up. So they said, we're going to sue, but what's going to happen? We said, well, Microsoft's going to try and sue you. And we looked at the Microsoft patent portfolio. They were very patent poor. And then we said, then they'll go out and buy patents. They have a big treasury. And so we said, let's go and find all the patents they might buy worldwide. And it narrowed down to about a couple dozen. We had a very small budget, and we decided instead of buying five so-so patents, we bought one. We blew the entire budget on one patent. When we got around to suing, we sued on one patent, homegrown at Stack, one patent we acquired. Microsoft countersued. Sure enough, they did the same exercise we had been through. They bought one of the patents that we had passed on. We called Bill Gates as an adverse witness. We were able to subpoena him for our trial. And he helped prove our case. And I do realize, of course, that Mr. Gates is going to be speaking here tomorrow, I think. He's a very smart guy. And by the end of trial, we had to figure out how much to ask for in damages. Now, if you took the stack revenues or the stack accumulated profits, what we asked for was many times either of those measures. I had to screw up the courage, given all the numbers, to ask for $110 million. The jury came back and awarded $120 million. But winning the case is only the beginning, because ideally what you want to do is have a good business deal and make a friend, if it's possible to do that. Early in my career, I did M&A work, corporate transactions, worked on taking companies public. I worked on tax matters. So I came up with the following. It was a two-part structure. First part, periodic payments to stack. It ended up being a million dollars a month for a number of years. Now, what's the beauty of that if you're a small publicly held company? You get $1 in revenue, and what's it worth to the enterprise value? Well, could be 20 times that, 50 times, or for a very small growing company, 70 times that $1. A million dollars a month for multiple years. And the win-win part of this is the other part of the structure. We said, Microsoft, why don't you pay us a chunk of cash? We need the cash. We could use it. But instead of it being something on which we pay taxes, you will buy a new class of preferred stock that we will create. Because of tax rulings in the past, we had to give it a coupon rate that was realistic in light of the market. They make the investment, and that helps Microsoft, because they don't have a deduction to the Microsoft earnings, because it's an investment. Stack benefits, because it receives this truckload of cash, and it doesn't have to pay taxes on it. And Stack would have the right, on the occurrence of certain events, into the future to redeem and convert the preferred stock into non-dividend paying common stock. And it all worked out. Now let me go on to the second story. This is before there was a biotechnology industry. I know a number of people here, including some senior people, have worked at Kleiner Perkins. And there was a young man who was in his 20s by the name of Robert Swanson. He was a business guy, but he liked to read about science. And he had read about these articles that said, well, maybe we can do something in biotechnology. These were very academic articles. No company was in this area. 
And he went to talk to people and he said, I think some of the best people are at UC San Francisco. And I know that some of you have had ties with UC San Francisco. And we talked to leading scientists there and they said, you gotta talk to Dr. Arthur Riggs at City of Hope. So Bob Sonson, he goes down to City of Hope. One thing leads to another. City of Hope didn't have the money to pursue some research that they wanted to do. And so the deal was only 300,000 would come from a new company that Kleiner Perkins would create, it didn't have a name, it was eventually named Genentech, and then the new company would get ownership of the patents and in return, the folks at City of Hope would get 2% of Genentech revenues and 2% of the revenues of other companies that Genentech would license. What were they doing? A lot of human diseases have to do with the inability of our bodies to make certain proteins at the right time. An example is diabetes. And for decades, scientists knew insulin was the key, but nobody knew how to make human insulin. And then Dr. Riggs and his colleagues said, hmm, Maybe we could trick some microorganisms, bacteria, but it's really tricky because people didn't know the sequence of human insulin, but they said, we'll, we'll figure it out. Very painstaking to do that at that time. And then we know the sequence and they would add amino acids to the sequence at either end to trick the bacteria into thinking that it was the bacteria's DNA that was being inserted and so the bacteria would be very happy and they became little pharmaceutical factories. So one of the first successful products was human insulin, still being used today by many companies. In addition, at about the same time, there was another dispute that related to uh, another patent portfolio. Now, Dr. Riggs started working with one of his other colleagues by the name of Dr. Kabili. For those of you who are familiar with the Kabili patents, you may know that they cover all of monoclonal antibodies. At first, this was a wonderful marriage, Genentech and City of Hope. It seemed like it was made in heaven. But then some of the scientists who normally aren't watching business news thought, hmm, we're hearing about this company and that company, and they seem to be using our technology. So we contacted Genentech and said, let's have a meeting. The discussions went on for months. They didn't lead anywhere. And finally, City Hope decided that we should file suit. So during the trial, we called a couple people as adverse witnesses. Um, one of them was Tom Perkins. He has said, uh, before he passed away, he is most proud of being a founder of Genentech. And he founded a lot of very successful companies. And we also sense that defense counsel did what defense counsel always do, and half the cases we handle are on the defense side and the other half on the plaintiff side, which is they're happy to have witnesses say, I don't recall. And they would have all of their witnesses say, I don't recall, so that it doesn't sound very credible that the most important agreement involved in a lawsuit, nobody recalls anything about it. We, I didn't know Mr. Perkins personally, but I knew a lot about him from others. A very accomplished guy, very smart, and he had an opinion of himself that was at least equal to those in the world at large who had a very high opinion of him. <laughs> and, and I may ask other people in the audience later whether that was true or not, but I'll tell you what happened. I always think in life, certainly in your personal life, as well as your professional life, you should have fun, particularly if it might be effective. So we thought, instead of the senior guy in the case, that's me, let's have a woman take Mr. Perkins' deposition. And we thought he would not like that at all. And then we said, 
not just have a woman take his deposition, but one of the most junior people on our team was a couple years out of law school. And we thought, he'll really dislike that. Now I'm gonna show you uh, one minute or so. It's from a deposition, but it was also played to the jury, and there's much more to it. And you be the jurors, decide whether this is someone you love and you trust and respect, or maybe you don't believe or have some disdain for, but it's up to you as jurors. So if we can play that short clip of Tom Perkins. Do you remember what terms you thought were important to have in the 1976 agreement? Oh. Did you ever see any drafts of the um, 1976 agreement? I don't recall. Um, did you ever speak with um, uh, Thomas Kiley about the negotiations of the 1976 agreement? I don't recall, no. Not this specific. Do you remember um, whether you gave final approval of uh, the 1976 agreement before uh, Genentech signed it? I don't remember. Um, do, you ever, do you remember discussing the 1976 agreement um, at any board meetings? No. So that gives you some flavor. We were successful at the end of trial. It did go up on appeal. We were told by the appellate bar for the state of California, because it was a contract action, that it ended up being the largest judgment ever upheld on appeal by California courts in any area of law. So that includes smoking cases, insurance cases, personal liability, every other area. Meanwhile, we settled the Kability patent dispute with Genentech. Ultimately, Genentech paid City of Hope and we became friends. So we, City of Hope, worked with arm in arm Genentech in enforcing the Riggs patent portfolio and the Kabili patent portfolios against about 40 different biotech and pharmaceutical companies, which all ultimately signed license agreements. So it was a great success. And there is information in the public record that the 2% that City Hope was to receive ended up producing annually for many, many, many years hundreds of million dollars in patent royalties. And there's a little bit of something that we're personally proud of, people in my firm. After all of the successes, City of Hope, which had for a couple decades earlier, started a graduate school that granted PhDs in biological science. They renamed it the IREL and Manila Graduate School of Biological Science. To our knowledge, it is the only graduate school named after a law firm. So those are two examples where there were tough battles, but in the end, a good thing was, after the tough battles were over, we made friends and friends that worked together for many, many years. And with that, I am happy to answer questions about absolutely anything. Do we have any questions? Any questions from the audience? Thank you. Thank you, okay, thank you again. Uh, what are the biggest tips you have to avoid even needing to go into a battle? As we know, that is an expensive thing. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. Let, let me focus mostly on startups. A lot of times startups, when they think about patents, they think about patents that will just protect their product. But there can be many other products that ultimately will compete directly with the startup's product. So you have to think about what someone else might do in the future and try and get patent protection for what they might do in the future. That's a very proactive way to go about it. 
the possibility of buying patents before there's any litigation is also something to think about because a lot of patents are owned by people who are just allowing them to collect dust on their shelves. Great research institutions do that all the time. And if there's no litigation and you go and approach them and you do a deal with them, and it can be stock, cash, a combination of things, because if you don't acquire those patents, someone else might acquire the patents. So those are two tips. I hope that's helpful. Uh, what is the best way to think about IP protection when your competitor is many, many times more powerful than you, have way more money than you, and even if you were to infringe your patent, you wouldn't have the cash to fight it? So how, how do you think about it? That's a great question. And one way to think about it is, oh, oh I'm, I'm scared. It, it's a rough analogy. Uh, think about if you were in Ukraine and you were the Ukrainian army and you looked at this mighty, one of the mightiest armies in the world called the Russian army. On patents, there's an advantage the small company has. It's all asymmetrical. Let's just assume that the small company and the big company are suing each other. And the big company has a revenue base that's 100 times greater than the small company. If the big company squashes the small company, it hasn't won very much. But if it loses to the small company, the amount of damages and the possibility of an injunction will be very costly. So it's asymmetrical both in terms of the potential damages and asymmetrical in terms of the injunction risk at well. And there's another part to this, sometimes the large company will have hundreds or thousands of patents. It's far better to have one or two good patents as illustrated by the stack situation. And a lot of times people, clients, say, well, we want to sue them for lots of things. We want to sue them in addition to patent infringement on antitrust grounds, unfair competition, business torts, committing lots of sins in life. A lot of times, Taking a high power tool and being very focused, A, makes it a lot less expensive, and B, ends up being much more effective in the end run. Let me mention one other thing, because sometimes we're on the side of the big company. And I can tell you what the big company thinks about. They think about what I've just discussed. They think, oh my goodness, this seems so unfair. So every time the United States has been in a war and it seems unfair, I'll use an example from many decades ago, it seems unfair that the Viet Cong can come out of the bushes, snipe at US soldiers, and run away in the bushes and disappear. Well, it is unfair, but they're at war. The big companies worry about the asymmetry that I just described. Another. So, Morgan, I'm going to ask you to just elaborate on the last question a little more because it's a really important question. Uh, could you comment on litigation finance being available to companies for that? We've used that very effectively in the live core versus Apple lawsuit. So could you just explain what that sure. is and elaborate? Because I think small companies have more power than they think on this financial issue. Yes, that, uh, what a wonderful question. And it is a very, very hot topic today. It started many years ago that there were companies that would raise capital and they would focus on providing funds for litigation, not just patent litigation. And it includes patent litigation. And they are willing to do all kinds of different deals, but in the end, they want some return on their investment. And they want a return that's several fold for their investment. Their investments are almost always non-recourse. So if they provide, I'll make up a number, 10, 15, 20 million dollars for the litigation, if the litigation's unsuccessful, they've lost their 20 million dollars. So they want the return and they will finance the litigation through the course of the litigation 
on this non-recourse basis. There are other structures, other deals. So someone, for example, a smaller company that has some patents but doesn't want to spend its own cash but is willing to give up a whole lot of the upside can go to one of these litigation finance firms. It's been very successful. There are some publicly held companies that are litigation finance firms, and it bothers a lot of companies in different industries, so they are today trying to lobby Congress to reduce, cut down, or eliminate litigation financing. Can I add just one more thought to it? Not only are these litigation finance companies able to finance your litigation, but they do something even more important to me. They have to do their own diligence because they only get paid if they win. And so they actually do diligence on the strength of your IP way better than your own lawyers will ever do because it's their money at risk, not your money. So just want to add that. Uh, that's a one, wonderful point. We are sometimes, at Irel Manila, hired by litigation firms because they're thinking of making an investment. And they will invest money for us to do the due diligence. And we may find prior art, just as an example, that the people at the company didn't know about, and then suddenly, oh, that prior art is going to invalidate our patents. So let's not go after big company, medium size, or small company, because that's not a very good endeavor. I'll mention one other thing that uh, is very important, that many companies of any size do not estimate. It's easy to estimate the out-of-pocket expenses for litigation. It's very difficult for people to wrap their minds around the huge investment of time of some of the most valuable people in the company, whether it's a CEO, a CFO, scientists, or engineers. And if you can, add that estimate, try to put a dollar value on it. It's far better to do that than to just ignore it and find two and a half years later you've been stymied in your product development because your resources, your scientific and engineering resources have spent too much time on the litigation. That's actually one the first way we work together. When I advise a lot of you startups out there, before you go to litigation, I would hire Morgan and his team to dig into the patents that we were filing just to find out all of the holes before you actually put the final filings in. There's one more, we have to, one last question. One of the, one of the things that our team is always looking at is we operate in the world of insurance and there's not a lot of software to go out and so we're oftentimes having to develop stuff from scratch and I constantly have team members asking about like, is this something that we should get a patent about or patent for? And the one thing that I'm always struggling with is dictating whether we should actually, one of the things that we're always uh, trying to contemplate is, is it actually worth our time to go through the process of getting a patent? Because anytime I think of patent, I immediately think of expensive lawyers and a lot of time that I could be putting towards selling the customers or developing product. And so what's the best way to, uh, I guess, determine is this something that I should actually look to get a patent for, or should I just keep it close to my chest as potentially a trade secret or something like that? That's a wonderful, wonderful question, and it doesn't have an easy answer. And the biggest problem is that there's an area of patent law that's gone to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court messed it up. They gave a test that nobody understands. So if you're talking to a district judge, a trial level federal judge, any, in any district in the United States, they say, I don't know what the Supreme Court meant by their decision. But here's a quick, easy, and inexpensive way to do it. Get a good patent prosecutor who knows software patents and have a discussion. It's an hour or two or three and that person can say, look, this class of things, you're not gonna get a patent on, or it's gonna be just so weak. And that's good advice. Or here's a narrower group of things that you may be able to get a patent on. And ultimately, of course, 
people can reverse engineer whatever you're doing when you have a product. Remember, you can have a product in object code form and people can reverse engineer that. If you embed it on a chip, guess what? People know how to peel back the chip and to read the zeros and ones that are embedded on the chip and to find out how your program in firmware is actually operating. So it's usually hard to keep it for a long period of time as a trade secret. Okay, yeah, so I think uh, with that we should um, transition to lunch. I wanna thank Morgan, and Morgan also promising never to sue Coastal Ventures, so that's, uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>